From fabulous Los Angeles, California, Hollywood, home of the stars, the magic factory where dreams come true, culture capital of the world, jewel of the Pacific, it's the Adam Carolla Show. Yeah, yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get it on. Mandate, get it on. Welcome to the program. Good day. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks in advance for sharing the show with a loved one and uh, telling everyone all about it. We do appreciate it, and we rely on you to spread the good word. Hey, David Wild. Good day. Hey, Mr. White Man. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Mangria White, that is. Allison Rosen, Hello. good to see you. Hello, Adam Carolla. Bald Brian. You know what's in that thing. Mike Berbiglia is coming in. Hey, they super likable. Mike Berbiglia. I was saying a second ago, the worst uh, drunken name ever, because if you get pulled over, uh, that should be part of the field sobriety test. Well, because you sound drunk when you say it, even if you're not. So yep. imagine if you really are. Right. So all the, you know, touch your nose and walk a straight line and count backwards from 100, you know, easy enough. But say Mike Berbiglia on just one shot of Robitussin, and you're going to fuck that up. Like, if yeah. you have more than two and a half beers in you, it's going to come out, Mike Berbega. It's, it's going to be a disaster. If they ask you to say it, refuse. Mm -hmm. Because then by the time they take you down to the station, you will have time to practice. It's what happens to me. I got pulled over just a few weeks ago on a Saturday night after a couple of drinks coming back from a dinner, and the guy said, uh, quick, what's your favorite comedian? And I said, Artie Lang. And he went, shit! <laughs> Really hit those teas. He had to let me go. <laughs> yeah, I picked an easy one. That's smart. Mm -hmm. I hope you had practiced that ahead of time. Yeah. But I can't. I feel like I would fail a field sobriety test. Yeah. Sober because I don't think I would be able to walk in a straight line or. <laughs> well, not with do, those boots. I mean, you got the you don't you got your boots no, ain't made for walking. I drive in um, Birkenstocks. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got my driving shoes. <laughs> Good. But even that or alphabet backwards, no. No. All right. Speaking of shoes. Tell me how, how yes, Brian. Well, so Berbiglia, sorry, just to follow up on that, it should be, he's like a divining rod for assholes because if you can find someone who doesn't like him, mm -hmm. there's probably a, something wrong with that person. You know yeah, that does not work. I am an asshole, but I really like him. Well, so we were, that's true. We were, Well, it's funny. Well, it works the one way. So yeah. a, I was laughing about that moments ago to myself because I played close to the vest <laughs> with the chuckles, but... Uh, <laughs> We're talking about, uh, we're going to give Michelle Branch a call a little bit later, I think. And I was watching her video with Carlos Santana. And I always just laugh. Like, has Carlos Santana's name ever come up and had someone go, oh, that soulless douchebag. <laughs> that fucking sellout, soulless, shit, god awful musician. Like, people have musicians and they love them, they hate them, they critique them, they whatever. Santana has always gotten a pass. I think. I think because I've never heard him say a word other than peace or love. And it, I, like no one's ever – like Santana's never went, let me weigh in on the homeless problem. Right. And so they're, they're, if you weigh in on the homeless problem, you're going to piss off half the city Ad one way or the other. Adam, you might want to sit down, but mm -hmm. I'm going to name drop that I was with Santana this weekend at this Quincy Jones uh, uh, Michael Caine tribute. Did he say anything? <laughs> he did. We got into an Said argument. Soul, peace, I argued love. with him about, about the 60s. About and so I will I will say I did unusually got into a little bit of a well, he, he's pro sixties it turns out I'm a seventies guy I'm but an 80s but guy. but I mean I've, I've I don't believe I've ever heard the guy interviewed I've never seen any like TMZ footage of him and I've never seen like a mug shot I've never seen him with his hat off like. I've never seen him not playing a, a guitar. It's just he plays the coolest guitar in the world. No one ever knows. Like, no one, like, you can go, oh, Santana's fabulous guitar player. No one goes, well, not really. He's pretty overrated. Like, there's none of that. He hooks up with people. The people sound better with him than without him. Hey, and I like never, Rob Thomas all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> and then, it, and then. The it's theory just, of relativity. There's just nothing to do with Santana. Yeah. The, is there a moment? Give us some dirt. Well, here's not dirt, but I remember I interviewed him for Rolling Stone the first, when he put out the Supernatural album, and he's the only person who I ever had to check the tape because the second thing I said was, how did you come up with the idea for this album? He goes, it was Clive Davis and an entity named, and I think oh. it was, and it, you know, he has an entity that he was talking right. to at right. this point, and you don't get that word no, entity a not. lot. Yeah. So he's, Jews have entiments, but there's no entity. <laughs> exactly. It's a nice coffee cake, a nice piece of Danish. Yeah, they yes, do a nice Danish. But not an entity named like uh, right. Biab -bob -bob. That it's, it's weird. <laughs> I would say per capita, Jews see less ghosts 
than any uh, people on the planet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you make oh, of that? Asians may see even less ghosts. They speak to their elders or mm-hmm. something, but the they spirits, don't see but ghosts. Not ghosts. Well, Jewish eyesight is very weak. That could explain why Jews and, see and, fewer and, uh, ghosts per capita. And also when they hear chains rattling in the attic, they don't go explore with a candle. <laughs> You, you know what I mean? You move. They call it the. They the, hit the on the, the alert button that's hanging around their neck. By the on star button. They had change rattling. No, yeah, I, change. I, oh, I, I was so moved the other day when I think it was a show yesterday, or a couple days ago. You're talking about the Shabbos Goy concept. Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but my favorite, the greatest Shabbos Goy in rock history was Elvis. Uh, Elvis Presley grew up in such a shitty part of, you know, town that there. That's also where they put the only Jew or two mm-hmm. in town, and he was. He would light the furnace for his rabbi neighbor, and in the auto, in the biography, uh, uh, there's a great series of biographies of him, uh, not autobiographies, but biographies. It says that the rabbi came to see him when he hit it big. They had like a reunion. I thought, wow. I like Elvis even more now. Wow, I did not know he was the Shabbos guy. Yep. Um, so uh, we will uh, talk to Michelle Branch uh, coming up at Mike Berbiglia as well. A few things to complain about. Tell me uh, who this dude is and what we can do about it. I haven't complained about this in a while. I've been backburnered it. But I think when we were flying back from Phoenix on Southwest, I just had the big load of dude sitting next to me. Now, what he had is he was sitting on the emergency exit, whatever. So he had the no seat. There's like the I middle love seat. That. It's the middle seat, but it becomes an aisle. Right. Like there's nothing between you and the window. It's a middle seat and an aisle. Yeah. It's a middle with the aisle on the a, left. Yeah. All right. Well, this guy was a big load, and he was sitting like like his balls hated each other. Yeah. You know, like the fucking had <laughs> Like the Hat- they were two North Magnets. Hatfields and McCoys. His two, like, they had to live in the same sack together, but like a sitcom from the 80s. They put some tape down the middle of their I remember apartment. that show. It was Mason Dixon about yeah. the two balls. That yeah, the two balls. His, like, his two balls hate each other. So- He's sitting in his seat. Familiarity breeds contempt. (laughs) With his fucking legs just wide open, just fucking akimbo, and he's a big dude. And I sit down next to him because there's no other place to sit, and his knee is clearly past the halfway. The halfway mark in a seat Mm -mm. is clearly delineated and defined by the the seat in front of you, right? You don't have to look behind you. It's the seat you can see. When you see your fucking leg passing the crack of the seat in front of you and see daylight on the inside of your knee, that means you're out of bounds. And by the way, you don't even split that. You come up to that, and then you stop with the outside of your right knee, right? Yeah, it's like lines on a tennis court. Yes. He's in the white there, area. There it is. Stop. So he's Out. And his legs are as wide as he can fucking get them, and he's just sitting there. He's not reading. He's not listening to earbuds. He's trying you know? desperately not to have anyone sit in that seat, even right. when they're sitting there. But the fucking flight is packed, and that's the last seat, and I get on, and he's... You know, my I'm six two, so there's not a lot of room in there. So I now he has the whole left side of the fucking airplane to sort of shift over. You can shift those knees over overage. to that side, right? His overage can go to left because there's no seat there. Now, so I do the one where I'm just sort of staring at his knee and staring at his knee and staring at his knee, and then at a certain point, I just go, "Oh fuck it, I'll just open my knees until it bangs up against his <laughs> knee, and then surely he'll move." No, no movement, and then I literally start then pressing. Then you're cuddling. Yeah, I'm pressing against. It's more than I got in fucking high school with this guy's fleshy tit knee, and I'm pushing <laughs> my knee against it, and it's like, he ain't he ain't moving. And We have spooning in row 17. Right. <laughs> and it, it's at the point where, are we going to have to have a conversation about this? Like, it's you just look down the line. It's way on the other side of the line. It's yeah, clearly encroaching. Yeah, it's like, does he have no nerve endings, or is it a standoff? Do you, yes, do you, do you not feel the warm thing with a pulse pressing up against the outside of your Dockers huge man? Can I ask you a question? Yes. Having flown Southwest back from Vegas myself, don't you think if you're buying million-dollar cars, you could go mm. from the $15 early bird Southwest, get on the plane early so you can pick a good seat? But I, he hates getting on early, hence ah, this conundrum. Ah, you're right. There's the rub. Well, here's my feeling. The thigh rub. My, my, my feeling is this. If somebody said we're taking a bus from Vegas to L.A., you paid twice as much for your ticket. Now, all those who paid twice as much for their ticket, go on and get on the bus. And then what? Well, then we'll load everyone else up, and about a half hour later, we'll leave. I would say is the person who had the first-class ticket or the person that had the expensive ticket, I have a better idea. I will be down 
at the Senior Pepe's <laughs> having myself a double Bloody Mary. Come get me when the bus is fully loaded, mm -hmm. and then I'll get on the bus, and then we'll leave. That's the way I would do it, and that's the way everything works when you pay extra. If it's, a bu if it's any other form of transportation, a van, a bus, a train, a donkey, I don't care. The guy who paid the most gets on at the end. Because yeah. what you do is you take a flight, especially if it's a half hour, if it's a one hour flight and that, that flight's, you know, 51 minutes, you get on 20 minutes early, you've added 40% to your flight experience. Yes? I've done the math. This is a funny coincidence because on the way back from Phoenix, I sat a Southwest flight guy with a very, very overweight man actually had to buy the two seats. So I was in poor oh, man's wow. first class. I, wow. was, I had the, uh, the aisle He bought seat. the two seats. He had to send the window seat, had to buy the second seat. He was just too big. He spilled over into the second seat. Well, so did this guy. I guess yeah. he didn't buy the they seat. They forced him to buy the second seat. So I had poor man's first class. Now, do they do, they do it beforehand, or are they super oh, yeah. uncomfortable no, no. afterhand? Definitely before, because on the seat between us was a placard that said, this seat's been purchased. So oh. no one, because every once in a while someone would look like, oh, I well, can't sit there. Uh huh. So that's like how in Punky Brewster, Henry would buy two opera seats before Punky came mm -hmm. into his life. It's exactly mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that. It's to oddly, say what fr oddly familiar. But Do you and Kevin Smith talk red state at all, <laughs> or is it just? Uh... I was wearing a hockey shirt. <laughs> but here's the really weird yes. part. I'd never seen this before. On the flight out to Phoenix, I flew uh, a different flight than you guys. Um, the two seats next to me, and Gary has a picture. I don't know if he's at the computer or not, but there's a picture. Yeah, the two seats next to me. Have had that Both on of them. They said, do not occupy. And I was like, well, I got this whole row to myself. This one seat's fine. I just sat down and I was like, oh, are there going to be some mm -hmm. flight attendants? Do you only like mm -hmm. a jump seat or some deadheads maybe? Some yeah. pilots or something? No way. The whole flight, not occupied. Gary, do you have the second picture that of is, the floor? That is bizarre as it, it was gets. bizarre. So you've never seen it before. Never and now it. here it is right next to you. Both seats. You're sitting on the aisle. And the seat against the window in the middle seat. There's a picture I took of the floor, which Gary may or may not have, but I think I may have figured out what happened. I think somebody someone. Yacked? I think you can see oh, a faint outline. Oh, somebody yacked. I think, oh. and there, there's what looks to be beaded up uh, napkin kind of stuff yes, going on rolled there. Rolled napkin. I want yeah. someone always to barf near I me feel on like the plane that may have first. <laughs> so wait, you somebody went out of your booted. way to choose the seat that was next to those? I, I no, was he didn't in know. a boarding group. No, oh. no, no, I sat down and I was just like, oh, there's no one sitting. Oh, there's. It was a pre-yacked right seat. Okay. Yeah, and it was very good. uncomfortable having to tell everyone who came back because I was like row six. Right. When it came past me on the plane, they're like, oh, those seats taken. I'm like, you can't sit here talk to the flight attendants i don't know what to tell you i had a a, a southwest experience where you went you went it was pretty casual but but actually uh what uh you call a mitzvah david wilde <laughs> i had a guy who was sitting next to me or sitting like one row behind me and there was another fat person a couple rows ahead of me and at a certain point one of the guys ahead of me said to the flight attendant oh um can i get one of those seat belt extenders and then the guy behind me went yeah, I'll grab one, too. And I thought, first off, what a great moment. Like, he must travel with this other fat person so he can casually just do the... Break the ice. Yeah, it's a kind of thing where when the waitress comes by and it's noon and you've already had three beers and she goes, can I get you guys another one? And you don't go, well, I don't want to be the alcoholic of the group. But if Brian went, yeah, I'll take another one, then oh, it's beer. much much easier for me to yeah, yeah. toss another one on for me, too. But I thought, first off, what are the... How long are you going to wait? Like, I guess this person must just sit there and wait to the very last second and then do the super casual. It was a great move. It was like, I'm not really that fat, but as long as you're in the fat guy, the husky section right. of the plane, getting the add a leaf on the belt, let's eh, eh, go ahead and mule one over here. I don't really need it. It was kind of like a, it was like, like the it great. Couldn't hurt. Couldn't hurt. Yeah. It's always good to have. I may put on some weight. Right. Those honey roasted peanuts, you know. <laughs> And I blow it a little when we get to altitude. Like, it was great. It was like he didn't have to ask for it at all. Yeah. That was awesome. Nice. All right. Listen, uh, certain things in life uh, literally are, are gut check time. Mm -hmm. And asking for the add a leaf like it's a, like, like it's a Thanksgiving table and you're – you're setting, you know, you're you're adding another three feet onto your lap belt on a Southwest flight. That that's gut. That's that's gut check time, literally. Like it's time to go. Maybe I should take it easy on the bugles. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to call my friend Jenny Craig. You like gotta, you got to take a long look in the funhouse mirror at that point. That's, that makes you skinny. That's right. The uh, so I had the leg. I had the leg wide guy. I also had this, and and I feel like there's not enough of this going on where 
you talk to somebody, in this case it was the guy, we had a couple things. Uh, the guy picked us up at the airport. Again, we got kind of lost because, you know, it was like, well, go down the escalator and then go up the elevator and see me on the fourth floor. I don't know why he didn't just go down the bottom of the escalator. And also, the the elevators you can't see, and it's a sharp, hard right as soon as you get to the bottom. And people don't speak specifically. Like, they don't go, go down to the elevator. As soon as you get to the bottom of the elevator, just go right. You'll go to the you'll go to the elevator as soon as you get down the escalator. They don't do it. They just go go to the elevator, but they don't say it's right at the bottom of the or the whatever. And the, by the same token, the guy at the hotel on Saturday when Mike and I said, uh, "Where's their breakfast joint?" He's like, "Ah, oh, there's a good breakfast joint down there on uh, Lincoln Street. There, it's just uh, up up this street and a couple." Uh, we walked 14 blocks. <laughs> like you know, they don't go like be prepared. For this kind of walk. Yeah. Like, it's going to be, you don't have to take a cab, but it's that point where you start getting confused. Like, are we going the right way? Because we've been walking for a fucking long time, and this guy did not say, be prepared to drown in your own sweat in the Phoenix Sun. Like, don't you feel like that person's job is to give you, like, a little indication of the 10, it's going to be 10 minutes? Or I think you've gone too far. Right. Something other right. than, yeah, turn left and just go down to Pear Blossom here. But if Pear Blossom is 14 streets right. down, if say it, if it. If taking a cab is an option, let the people know. Because right. obviously you guys aren't locals. You wouldn't be in the hotel no. if you were. We walked and we walked and we walked some more. All Was right. Was it worth it? Uh, yeah, we had a lovely uh, breakfast. We held hands and we did what we do. Speaking of, uh, I want to get to shoes. I don't know why your boots came up, but um, tell me. I was failing a I'm, I'm feeling, I'm, oh yeah, I'm feeling marginally raped by some loafers. <laughs> and um, I had a situation with my buddy Daniel, who's a good guy and a hipster. And he, I saw him, I saw him in here one day and he's wearing some hip loafers like suede loafers with some uh, fur in them. And I go, oh, those are some cool shoes. And he goes, yeah, you like them? And I said, yeah, I do like them. I think those are uh, pretty cool shoes. And he goes, yeah, all right. And then because he's one of those guys who just, Danny Two Sheets, it takes a life by the, by the <laughs> horns. He calls me from New York like two weeks later and he goes, hey, Buzzaboo, I'm down here in Soho. I'm looking at a pair of beautiful suede shoes with fur in them with your name on it. How about I get you a pair? I'll send them over to you. I would hang up. And I said, uh, yeah, let's do it. And I said, how much are they? He's like, 155 bucks. And I said, yeah, man, sure. Send them out my way and uh, tell me what I owe you. And uh, so he sends, and a week later, I get a box of super gay high top tennis shoes with fur in them that I would make fun of other people for wearing. Like I look at guys, there's nothing weirder. There's, there's two shoes. There's two shoes that are weird. There's a we weird, generic old person shoe. I don't know. Weird beige. Yeah. You're looking so, <laughs> Wait. by the way, I, I like when old people have way too much soul. Like grandpa, yeah. you ever think you're getting to the bottom of that Tootsie Roll <laughs> pop? I don't think so. <laughs> you're never going to see tread on those things. You're shuffling around. You're 83 years old. They only touch carpet at the nursing home. Why do you yeah. have these seven inches of vulcanized rubber under there? You're cobbler, cobbler proof. Right. So, and you're, you're curling over because of the spina bifida much faster than you're going up. <laughs> so it's actually your ass is raising, but th your neck is lowering. It's, it's, adding to the problem that's so, the best spina bifida joke i've heard all day <laughs> it's certainly top it five it kills so you know there's the old person shoe that has the weird uh like velcro and they're beige and all that kind of stuff and there's black and beige and there's and, and then there's the young hipster shoe which is kind of a joel McHale shoe you have to see him mm. on, on on them but they're they're like they're brandless they're smooth they're cool too cool you know there's plenty just reeboks and nikes and there there's there, there's so Are many they a slip on is it a slip on cool shoe the worst is is the high the high top it's like a high top hipster tennis shoe it's kind of it's kind of what chucks are it's kind of Kind of the converse chucks, but but no no branding on it or anything. Anyway, I said I, I can't. The kind you find on like uh, Gap or Banner Republic. Yeah, I said I, I can't be caught thing. dead in these shoes. They have fur in them. There's leather. They're high tops. Uh, no, I need some regular tennis shoes. So I said, uh, Daniel, this is not. 
you know, what I had in mind. It's I'm not, not what he had. It's not what, not what I was looking at. I thought this, we're kind of talking about what I was looking at. And he said, oh, buddy, you don't like them? Well, you know, we'll take them back. We'll figure it out. And then I felt stupid. And they sat in a box in the front of here for a long time. And then at some point, I ran into them at a Malfi show. And I just, I just gave him cash. I just gave him like 160 bucks. It felt bad. And then he said, I'll grab the shoes next time. And he grabbed the shoes. And then he said to me the other day, he said, hey, listen, listen, listen. This was... Uh, we went over to uh, Kimmel's, uh, Kimmel's, uh, I don't know, uh, his niece, no, 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 his, uh, oh, I don't know, cousin's house over for Easter. He said, hey, I got, I got the shoes. I got the new shoes in the car. I got your new shoes in the car. I was good. Oh, good. Right. Well, he just gave me his shoes. <laughs> so huh? now these shoes, I, you know, they're not, they're not tattered and torn but they're clearly they're worn they're, they're clearly used like they're, are, another you're literally walking in another man's shoes yes yes i know what it's like to walk in buzzaboo's shoes now so uh it was like all right i i like i i didn't want to say anything i i appreciate the effort but now i got 155 fifty-five dollar pair of pretty well used shoes that feels Pre-owned. a little bit like the bowling alley <laughs> I just don't. Yeah. I don't like the putting my feet in. Uh, I'm not a fan. But he seems like an immaculate guy. He's, but you're wearing them. I well, I wore them. I wore them for a reason. <laughs> okay. I wore them to prove a point, and so that others don't <laughs> have to. But you know what I'm saying. All right. So uh, it was a weird. The, the the whole transaction does not feel gratifying to me. No. Now, is it because of the amount, or because these are someone else's shoes, or both? I think I paid. I basically paid top shelf price for like Smirnoff or pop off vodka or yeah. something. I you was, I was well paying shoes. for some new shoes and I got some used shoes <laughs> out of the deal. The deal wasn't, may I buy those shoes off you? It's if you see those shoes again in a new form, may I purchase them? Careful what you compliment next time. <laughs> that's a good that's a good point. Yeah, I love your butt plug. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, this <yeah>? whole thing? <laughs> we'll get you one. I don't know about the fur on the inside. That seems <laughs> Seems like trouble. <laughs> All right. Uh, David Wild, guess who saw Pain and Gain? You. I heard you. Is this your review? I was. I heard about this yesterday. You were going to review it. Yeah, that's right. Great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, interesting, Brian. You can uh, you can take a look. You can you can bone up on. I don't need. The, I'm familiar uh, with the, 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 the principles, but I'll take a look and see. The, yeah, the take a look. You can uh, bone up over there. All right, pain and gain. Now, um, me and uh, Bill Simmons saw this movie uh, a couple days back. I don't believe it's out until like the 25th or something like that of uh, April. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty early yeah, 26th. review. 26. It's a, uh, let's see, Michael Bay. Um, it's... The Rocks in it, Mark Wahlberg, uh, Anthony Mackie. A- A- Anthony Mackie's one of these actors, African American gentlemen, who you would recognize from a bunch of movies, but you might not recognize his name. I think that you know him best from The Hurt Locker. He was the black guy in The Hurt Locker. Mm, That's yes. Probably his most well known. Yeah, yeah. And Million Dollar Baby and uh, things like that. Very good. Everyone's good. Um, the story, they, you know, you can't believe it's a true story because a bunch of bizarre shit happens and i do think it's one of these things where it is a true story but that means doesn't mean every part of it's true it seems like there's a lot of stuff that happened in between that was i don't think michael Michael bay based on everything i know is not a real major documentarian type of film yeah so some of it seemed a little over the top um tony shalhoub was in it he was good um the rock is really quietly turning into a really good actor he's a leading man he's a bankable leading man in this movies. in this movie he played a character that was uh you know macho but had a sort of a feminine side and did a real soft-spoken thing and was very charismatic and very interesting and very religious and it just the story took you place. love him yeah, it, it, he he was really he's showing like I can tell and he's he's probably this kind of guy. He brings a crazy work ethic into everything he does. And I'll bet you he got this script six months ago and dove into it with like a coach and really started like working on the nuances of it. Because unlike the, you know, Jean-Claude Van Dams of the world and the Schwarzeneggers of the world, he's definitely going, I'm not just a guy with the biceps who can sort of get by because of the looks. Uh, he is definitely going for some nuances and some angles here. 
Uh, Wahlberg's Wahlberg, always always good, always kind of fun and interesting. It, it felt like Wahlberg was playing Wahlberg in this. Like that's he's hit or miss, him. but when he's hits, he's really really good. Boy Nights is great, and the fighter was great. Yeah, uh, takes place in a gym, uh, Miami, all that great look, kind of mid nineties thing. Uh, it's one of these things where if you find yourself rooting for the heroes, you're really rooting for horrible people. <laughs> which yeah, you really are heroes. rooting for horrible people. And you do kind of find yourself rooting for him, and then you kind of stop rooting for him. It, it was also one of these movies that had a lot of humor in it, and it's the kind of humor that only Quentin Tarantino can really pull off, which is a lot of violence and gore with humor mixed in. This was, some of it landed, but then when it doesn't land, it lands with a thud on its hip and it breaks is one of them known as pain and one as, as gain is it like night and <laughs> no, day that movie no. with a k night no and day? no that was such an awful movie it is it, that's bad it movie. is oh. no uh yeah it is no uh uh turner and cash or my turner and hooch. 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 no tur- oh, tango tango and cash. cash tango and cash <laughs> yeah Losing it. So Tango and Hooch would be a good uh, sort of sequel. Great, great mo- two. movie in terms of like looked great. Uh, dialogue was eh, had its like moments. You couldn't call it. And now there's a lot of these movies that are starting to fall under this heading for me. You couldn't call it a great movie. Mm. I don't know if you'd call it a good movie, but I would say watch it. Competent sounds like Michael Bay makes always at least competent movies. Stuff like, looks most stuff looks amazing. Yeah. A little, I think he falls a little short in the humor department. That was the thing I was going to say. You asked me to look over the cast and whatever, and I did. I had only seen the trailer so far. I didn't expect that Rob Corddry was in the movie. Didn't expect that Ken Jeong was in the movie. Didn't expect that Rebel Wilson was in the movie. You Rebel Wilson is she's yeah. an Australian girl, the maybe huskier yeah. gal. Yeah. But apparently, I didn't realize there were so many comic. Uh, presences in the film. Yeah, and Rob Corddry's doing a real serious character, and oh, really? it never. Yeah, no. it's 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 interesting, and it's it's cast as interesting cast, and I would definitely, it's a kind of movie that if you saw it, and you said, I love this movie, I'd say you're nuts. <laughs> but if you saw it and said, I really liked it, I'd go, yeah, I could see that. And if you saw this movie and went, oh god, it sucked, I'd go, I can see that. I know this is a horrible review. <laughs> I am saying... I know, I know it's a smash because my 13 and 15-year-old both want to see it. That That's what makes a movie a hit. Yeah. And yeah. That, they're gonna, it's going to be a hit. It's very homoerotic. So, um, your girlfriend or wife is definitely not going to be into this. That that much, I can promise you. You hook up with David Wilde's 13-year-old son, get some ice cream, <laughs> go see this with him, and get some wine coolers just to take the edge off. Yeah. Kid I'm can be loud in the up. car. Yeah. So uh, if you want some just if you want some fun and if you want to have to keep thinking that it's based on a true story, which is sort of freaky and it's stylized and it's interesting. But it really I I sort of defy you to see this movie and figure out whether it's thumbs up or not. And it's going to get some weird reviews Mm -hmm. or some pretty wildly mixed reviews. I'm trying to think of what Rotten Tomatoes is going to what it's going to come in at. I will see this in a couple of weeks and we'll talk about it. it is. It is very well. It's well crafted. It's a lot of fun. It's always great to look at Wahlberg. He's all buffed up, yoked up. It's great to look at The Rock. Lots of really interesting scenes, but also movie. And I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but uh, I I felt this way with Olympus Has Fallen and that kind of stuff, where they're good movies to a certain point, and then at a certain point, someone says, we got to get out of here. Like, we got to wrap <laughs> this up. Like, let's. it's sort of a thing. It wasn't a golden time. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a thing where it's like the band is playing and they're rocking and they're jamming and at some point the bass player looks aside and the guy's giving the wind it up kind of thing and they, they look like Room service at the hotel is closing. Yeah, let's let's bring it on. We're gonna get fine yeah. if we go past midnight. Like there's a weird thing that a lot of movies do. I thought Olympus uh, has fallen. It was that kind of movie where it had had a nice build and it, it worked nice. At the, at the halfway point, you're like, "Hey, what's going to happen here?" And then at the end, it's just like, "Ah, let's get out of here." It's like it was pacing itself in a race, and it saw the finish line. It's like, "Oh, it's time to sprint!" Right. And it just it just went. It's almost like sometimes like a movie looks at its own watch and goes, "Jesus Christ, we're 81 minutes into this thing. All right, people, let's bring it home now." <laughs> and but the story, you're not, you may be that much into it, but you've not solved yeah. whatever we you, like. It checks out and then it just drags on. Yeah, kinda. you did a lot of setting up, and now ah, eh, just solve it quick, make quick explosion, get out but of here. But what's weird is yes. What's weird is that they don't shoot it in sequence necessarily. So do, what do you when when do you think that oh fuck we got to get out of here happens in the writing of it? I I think it happens in the editing 
And I think somebody goes, we're cracking two hours, let's get out of here, or we're coming up on, you know, 100 minutes, let's bring it home. There's an element of that. Um, also, if you're not Judd Apatow, the studios now will push you that way so hard. Also, people don't know how to make movies in the sense that it's real easy to come up with the, you know, the White House has been taken. The president is down in a bunker. He's there with North Korea and whatever. And uh, you go, how are they going to solve this? And then you go, oh, they're not. Bunch of guns. They're, they're not really going to solve it. Like, yeah. So it's easy to set up the really cool interesting part and then the way you solve it sometimes is a little bit of a cop out yeah a bunch in, of guns slow motion we'll solve it in that respect in with respect to olympus has fallen i think at least in terms of that movie they had to get the dollars on the screen and the dollars were the white house invasion part and olympus actually falling and once they're inside the white house then it's just let's shoot them up and get it over with like the, right. the dollars have to be on the screen right all right so Pain and Gain, uh, Bill Simmons, not a massive fan of it. I don't think anyone was a big fan of it that I saw it with, but definitely worth a look. And if you don't need to be swept away, you merely want some sort of entertainment. And again, the, the, the thought that it's based on a true story and it's so bizarre running through your head time and time again with a few points and a few beats that are like, eh, we didn't need that or that wasn't funny or I don't know why we tried to shoehorn in the comedy there. But uh, mindless fun. And uh, what was it? Michael Bay? Mm -hmm. It's Michael Bay. It's going to look good. All right. It's going to look good. Uh, David Wilde? Sir. Were we going to call Michelle Branch? On the, on the air? I don't know. I didn't know that. But if you want, I'll give the number to someone in there. It's my fault for talking to Dawson about it. I don't. I don't know what the, we were, that, that they call turn be into. Made they, the they turn into producers <clears throat> at the weirdest times. Yeah. Turn into. Thanks, I think, Allison. <laughs> Way I meant, to go. I don't. Uh, I think it's clear what I meant. I'm I not love sure all what of you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what the plan. The story is that uh, you were you're you're doing a benefit and you need some entertainment. You have some great stars already. Yeah, the Cinco de Mayo and party. I just tweeted yeah. and I tweeted her saying, mm -hmm. "Would you entertain an offer from?" Adam and she said she would in exchange for a bottle of Mangria. Uh huh. She's a Date. Mangria fan. Yeah. So uh, we can call her off the air or on the air, whatever you like. Yeah, it was going to be off the air. I just needed you to reach out to her personally. That was what I asked you. <laughs> awesome. It wasn't wasn't All right, well, on doing... the show. Okay. All right. All right. Um, then I'm confused in three different ways. That's fine. We'll call her. We'll call her off the air. That's fine. That's always better. And uh, do you think you can get her? And by the way, that's where the whole Santana thing uh, came about. Her sort of, uh, oh, she has a couple big hits, but seems real sweet. And by the way, now that you're bringing it up, uh, May 5th in uh, Malibu, John Popper's going to be there. And uh, it's the benefit. We've done it before at the Malibu house. Everyone comes out. It's glorious. You hang out. You hear some music. You rub elbows with the celebrities and the kids at the hospital are the benefactors. Can yes. I just say that I actually wrote about that today in the book that I'm writing. I wrote about the last time we were at your house for one of these. It was the Shakespeare event. And uh, Ray had not seen A lot of people hadn't seen me since I announced my diagnosis of the brain tumor on the show. Ray saw me the, for the first time, grabbed me in a bear hug and screamed, you got to live, man. You got to live. <laughs> I'm like, all right, Ray, I'm going to do my best. <laughs> but everyone's around sipping Maybe champagne. Maybe that healed you. At a Shakespeare event and Ray, <laughs> Ray screaming at the top of his lungs. <laughs> Uh, Apparently yeah. it worked. It yeah, worked. so like far so good. It's time for a re-up hug. <laughs> uh, David Wilde. Sir. What did you have to say for yourself? <laughs> uh, in general, in yeah. about life, I wanted to declare that uh, I love accidental racists. Mm -hmm. That I introduced Brad Paisley and LL Cool J. Oh, yeah. And oh, you're I, a lot, and I, a lot of and talk I, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. No, I caused a national commotion. I, I feel I've been in a support group for the two of them. Uh, it's actually worked out to be great because I don't think anyone has ever spoken more about them. Well, ever since those two set that bomb off in Boston, people have been pretty quiet <laughs> about this. I brought you uh, Brad's oh, record because I want you to listen to it. And but I think it, once you hear it in context, I you'll listen. understand. It's one of these things where everyone is talking about this, for instance, and then a bomb goes off. Some people get hurt. Some people die. And then we go, oh, fuck it. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So which 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 to me is. How much did we really care in the first place when we just abandoned something? Go fuck it. We'll talk about something else. Like w it's a slow news week versus the well, non-slow news week. A national catastrophe of a song. <laughs> yeah, but we didn't. No, but what I'm enjoy it. What I'm saying is, is nobody. I I have my feeling is that 
nobody first off it's it's a weird time that we're living in because we've we've never been bigger narcissists mm-hmm. and a true narcissist i know because i am one don't really give a shit about you know brad paisley and ll cool j singing a song that we know like we know ll cool j and brad paisley aren't Klansmen or they're not part of the f- fucking black power movement or whatever the hell, uh, the, you know, the Black Panthers. There's none of this, right? So we don't give a shit. We know they don't pose a danger. We know they're not, you know, putting their scary thoughts into our youth and doing this. And, but yet we have to talk about it and pretend like we're concerned. I mean, you know, whether it's Alec Baldwin calling his 14-year-old daughter a little piggy girl or whatever the hell it is, we have to get all, but we don't care. No, like, when have we, here's an interesting time interesting time in our life when have we cared less and pretended to care more since we're only care about ourselves like there's yeah. nobody gonna storm the beach at normandy anymore we don't care that much well we don't care about that we do care about these guys and then there's an explosion and then we don't care like can, here's here's the question can someone be such a narcissist that they don't have any time left or interest in mocking other people somehow they go hand in hand because i feel like it's not like outrage over brad paisley and ella cool j as much as there's a lot that can be poked fun at here. Well, what there's whatever Sorry, it is, David. it's 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 not me being thrown into the proverbial volcano, and we're all just crazy yeah, natives now any of us. that need somebody to be tossed in a volcano to soothe us. Like every ten seconds, somebody has to be tossed in a volcano. But when an actual volcano erupts, like in Boston, then we all shift our attention over right. that, and then we talk about that. See, what happened was it's one of the first Twitter controversy meltdowns mm. because it's a hashtag that people loved accidental something you know right it's a good it, it literally is the title of the song which you know what's funny is i was around you know i introduced the two i was there when they started working it out and the truth is they wanted to make it something that people would talk about but i do think that twitter reality of a good that title was a hashtag that people just it exploded on twitter we were all uh brad did so i saw it a little after they did, but literally just their names rose up on Twitter, and right. that's how. And then comedians jumped in with accidental jokes. What's their uh, reaction to the reaction? They well, I talked to both of them throughout the week, like constantly, but they were surprised. But in the end, I think no joke. They thought this is great because all we wanted was to talk about this weird mm-hmm. racial, you know. It's time we start a dialogue. Exactly, a conversation. <laughs> we got to have a conversation it's about music's racism. Music's turn. That's well, the time. You know what? The thing yeah. is, I know the wise ass. I would get more credibility by thinking that there is, there is a conversation. That we have I, to have it. I agree. We have to have it because it will <laughs> not go away. I'm tired of waiting. No, somebody has to have a conversation about racism. It's got to be done. Well, listen, you yeah. you hate all people equally, so you're in a different uh, vantage point than the rest of America. But there are issues. The, yeah, there are there, there issues. Other than your the conversation. Head. Here's here's the conversation everyone needs to have. Um, stay together, raise your kids, educate your kids, pay your taxes, move on. That's the conversation. It wasn't much of a conversation. Let's try that, it. That was a verse they cut out. Let's try it, and then we'll see what happens with all forms of, of racism. Let's Good. just see. In this country, we don't need to have conversations in this country about racism not in 2013 we just don't we don't need to have the conversation or we've been talking until we've been blue in the face for the last five years i don't think things have gotten much better so maybe we should zip it focus on education raise your families and see what happens have you forgiven his gold chains because if you do he'll forgive the iron chains (laughs) listen the mason dixon line is fixed (laughs) so, <laughs> let's let's be happy. All right. I, all right. All I say is, you listen to that album. You know, and I Brian, shall. Brian and I went to see him not that long, a few months ago. It's a great. He's date. a great artist. Great. It was a hot date for us. You listen to the record and tell me what you think in context. The album is really okay. great. I shall uh, listen, and then we'll continue this dialogue about racism. It's time off, off the air. Uh, no, my my contention is we've had more conversations about race since we've had a black president, which is something that 20 years ago, if you said to somebody when we didn't have as many conversations about race in 1995, once you elect a black president, are you going to have more conversations about race or not? Everyone would have laughed and said, no, we've ratcheted it up, but we've had to ratchet up. That's in compensation for having a black president. I don't think the song and I'm pretty sure I'm on sturdy ground here, mm-hmm. is about having a big conversation about race. Good. It's about talking to one another yeah. across divides. Okay. That's all it's about. And it's and no joke, that's part of why it took off, is that people said, what is this guy doing with this guy? And the truth is, 
they're talking, and I think that's uh, and musically, they're both great guys. They're they're literally the two best guys uh, I know in music. So all right, enough all enough, right. enough black and enough, enough domino ass kissing, please. <laughs> or color of ass you can't kiss. David Wilde, everybody. Uh, you can tweet him at Wilde about music. He's catching up to Rick Springfield as we speak. So let's uh, have him meet his goals. I am not. All right. I don't I'm black. Care. I'm not catching up yet. Uh, you're being held down by Rick Springfield. Uh, Mike Berbiglia in studio next. Sleepwalk movie.com uh really enjoyed it by the way saw the saw the movie um i'm trying to think i think if you gave me a copy of it or i saw it on cable or on netflix uh, yeah it was really it was really interesting he Um, did give you a copy because i got it afterwards and i liked it a lot as well um who played your your girlfriend in that movie? lauren ambrose she did a really nice job remember her from six feet under yes and uh she's an extraordinary actress uh, you did a nice job yourself, Mike. Thanks. <laughs> Everyone likes Mike Berbiglia. <laughs> I was talking to my agent about him uh, today, and he said, uh, oh, he's funny. Yeah, tell Mike said. Baby Doll, James Baby Doll Dixon says Oh, James hi. Dixon. Yeah, yeah, I love him. Mm-hmm. What does he do? What does he do all day? He, he talks James to me Dixon. on the phone. <laughs> he's got four multi-million dollar clients, <laughs> and then he just hangs out all day. <laughs> That's uh, me and J- James Baby Doll Dixon at my uh, photo shoot for uh, oh, yeah. uh, 50 Years Will Be Chicks. Uh, not Taco Bell material out in uh, paperback as we speak, <laughs> if you like. I uh, Well, you know what happened? Yesterday, I was complaining about this on the air. Yesterday, I said I was on a conference call. And because I get no phone reception at my house and I was on a conference call in my car, I had to keep driving in a circle. Oh, wow. Through the same neighborhood, because if I go past a certain point, the phone will cut off. Yeah, and then at some point, an irate woman came out to her porch about the fifty-fifth time I passed her house and gave me the "What the fuck? What are you doing? Why are you casing our neighborhood in your super nice car, white person?" And she must have been confused. <laughs> she said all like, of that with her look. Wow. She said her her look. It was a whims of look because. She knew it was the middle of the day. Like, she knew I wasn't robbing yeah. the place. But why do I, what do I do? What, just White collar crime. I must something. hate fuel and vulcanized yeah. rubber. Like, that was her <laughs> thing. And then, so today, me and Baby Doll Dixon were having a semi-passionate and somewhat heated discussion on the phone. And I, I started to do the loop again and then went, oh, my God, what if I run into that woman <laughs> two days in a row? So I did the move where I just pulled over to the side of the thing. And then I had the fucking, who is this person when you pull over as far as you can to the side of the road and the person coming up the hill behind you just stops behind you? And you're like, <laughs> N- no, no. First off, how much do you not want to arrive at wherever you're going? <laughs> yeah. I, like, I'm going to a, sh- a shallow grave that I've dug on top of this mountain and I sure don't want to get there. Like, I'm pulled over. I'm stopped. I, I don't know what I'll say. And then once that person behind you stops, well, then anyone behind them has to stop because once the first person stops, you, the, the fifth person can't kick around yeah. at that mm. point. And you're like, go around. Like, I've had that happen a million times. Where I've just turned right and pulled up doing, you know, Mike, you're doing a radio interview and you pull the side of the road like and you got your earbuds in. And you're like, do it. And the person just, they just suck up behind you. Like, what? Yeah. Well, There's I, physical space for them to get around you. T- yeah. plenty of physical I wouldn't if there wasn't space I wouldn't do it like I would not just block well, everyone I was behind the person who actually was stopped in the middle of the street talking to someone and as I came up behind so I had to pull into the you know oncoming traffic lane to get around he put his hand out the window and did the super slow go around me thing mm-hmm. and the fact that it would have taken like a whole minute for his hand to to go all the way around the clock mm-hmm. Was I, for some reason it's driving me insane. Like, why would you ever move your hand so slow? Just, just do a wave. Yeah, like, I don't what know speed why. Do you guys but, wave someone by? Well, he didn't want to interrupt the air? pollen. I don't uh, yeah, know. Yeah, it was like he was trying not to interrupt the air. It's like I, I, I don't know. The fire but rhythms are off. I, it was like I literally the day before I drove in a circle, and this time I went. If I see that woman in her irate face out on her porch again, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to. I'm going to sink into the seat and you won't be able to see me over the dash. So (laughs) I will just pull over. And it took less than four seconds for someone to get stuck behind me. And I just thought, what the fuck is going on? All right. Sorry, Mike. No, no. It's such a weird town to drive in from from someone who lives in New York. Because I came here from from the Sofitel is where I'm staying in Hollywood. Mm Mm-hmm. 
drove to here took an hour. Yeah. While I'm driving, I mean it's ten miles. Just so people hearing this uh, yeah, elsewhere, it's like that's a, a long time for maybe nine 10 miles. and a half. Yeah. yeah. And when you're driving, you're thinking this might take a couple years, or it might take like ten <laughs> yeah, minutes. It's interminable. But I don't know. And you're so trapped. Uh, I and, do, I, and even if it takes fifteen years, you go. That's not that long. The <laughs> The, the part that always drives me nuts that I always have to scream about when, like, we're driving out to Irvine and I'm on the 101 or the 5 or something is it at a certain point when we're on the freeway and we come to a complete stop. <laughs> like, I understand there's traffic and we've slowed our clip down to just a trickle. But there are points when you literally stop. There is zero movement. It's like... Is there ever any excuse that we physically come to a complete halt in the middle of the yeah, fucking I freeway? Yeah, I thought about that. What is that? Does that mean that there's an accident somewhere or there's construction you, somewhere? I've, I've had it happen where stop? you don't pass anything. It's just we literally are stopping. We've all agreed yeah. that we don't want to get to wherever we're going to. We've come to a complete stop. And this fucking city, now I've said it before, but I'm pissed. Because when I used to do... <laughs> Are you sure? I know I'm mad. Yeah. When I used to do... No, I'll tell you why I'm fucking pissed. Because I hate the hypocrisy of this city. I hate the idea... I don't mind morons. And I don't mind smart people. But I don't like when people turn it on and turn it off for their shit versus your shit. You know those people that treat your sure. shit like, Oh, man, I'm sorry I left your convertible open out in a fucking hailstorm. I didn't notice. But their car's inside, and they're putting <laughs> another coat of fucking Carnuba wax on it. And you go, if that was your fucking car, you wouldn't have forgot to put the fucking roof up on it. There's not like, I treat my shit wildly different than I treat your shit. And I don't like that because if you're smart and you treat your shit right, then you should treat my shit right. Or you're an imbecile and you thrash your shit and my shit. At least you're consistent. The city is very smart when it comes to uh, they have parking meters that now sense when a car has left and go back to zero. So you can't get the 12 minutes that some asshole paid for. Oh. That's, uh, I would say, by the way, that's God's 12 minutes. That's not the city's 12 minutes. That 12 oh. fucking minutes has been paid for. Yeah. It, it really has. Like, you go, it's a quarter for every 15 minutes, and somebody threw an extra quarter in. All right, meter, meter maid. If it's two hours and you put in $2, the meter itself in digital printout says car must be moved after two hours. And I, I actually spent a good chunk of the day just reparking on the same street. Will they actually ticket you if you stay if you put more money in it and stay there? I don't. Sometimes they'll check. Sometimes they won't. But a meter that reboots to zero when the person paid for an extra twelve minutes. It, it be, you know what it'd be like? It'd be like if we're at a fucking bar and I just went over and went. Uh, I'm gonna buy that Mike Barbiglia guy over there. I think he's funny. I'm gonna buy him his Blue Moon. And then I dropped five bucks off or ten bucks off and walked out of the restaurant. The restaurant went. I'll be taking that. <laughs> and by the way, you'll be paying full fare for your Blue Moon. <laughs> like, no, yeah. you won't. I paid for it. So you pay for your parking meter. You put in, you pay for an hour and you use 41 minutes and you leave. Well, then guess who, who the benefactor of that? The next person who slides in who gets a free 19 minutes. But no, the city's smart. They, they make more revenue if it goes back to zero. And then you refeed it again. But when it comes to moving traffic around, they become full fucking blown retards. So... <laughs> Because no money in it for getting you getting you from your hotel over to my studio 15 minutes earlier, not a moneymaker, but handing out chicken shit tickets and having me <laughs> meters and all that. So, okay, I worked at Loveline in uh, Culver City for a million years, and it used to drive me insane because I had two choices. I went there once. It's so far, right? Yes, Culver, Culver City? Yes, Brian lives there. <laughs> That's how far. <laughs> Very convenient for me. <clears throat> I could either get back home to Hollywood by making a big horseshoe going down the 110 toward downtown or going down the 10, getting on the 110, shooting across, and then going back down the 101, which was way out of my way. But at midnight, I was going 85 miles an hour the whole time, and I'd get home faster than if I just cut all the way across the city and took like La Brea or Western or something, just went all something, the way across the city. Yeah, psychologically rewarding about if you're going a little farther, driving 85 miles just making an hour time. The whole time. Just yeah. making time. But what used to make me absolutely insane is 
every eh, once a month, I'd get to the exchange that led on to the 110, and the 110 would be closed. And it would be backed up. The ramp would be backed up and the whole tent. And I'd have to then go get off the freeway and wherever they film Chico and the man and fucking be lost. <laughs> and judgment try to, night. Judgment night. Basically turning. I'm trying to Winnebago with Cuba Gooding Jr. And that's what would happen. And it would spit me out in South Central L.A. Now, my thing was I passed Three big electric freeway signs, the ones that say click it or ticket or buzz driving is drunk driving or keep your eyes on the road or some other bullshit that doesn't move us along any faster. I passed three of those. None of them said 110 southbound or northbound closed from the 10. Like they, they could have actually passed on some information with one of those big informational signs, in which case <laughs> I would have happily turned off on Western or any other street before I got there. But no, they just waited till I got there. Well, I went and did Loveline last week for the first time in a long time. Yeah, every once in a while I come on and I got on the freeway and I started heading back and passed under all the fucking blank freeway signs till I got to the 110 northbound and closed. And this time I got off again at... uh, Chico on the man spot, cut across downtown, and then ran into like just marauding groups of homeless people. There's a whole, there's a whole tent city going on down there. Have you guys seen this? No. no. There's tents. Oh yeah, 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 downtown. Yeah, they're yeah. they're pitched all over the sidewalk. And it's one block away from like the cool hip places too. Like yeah, I mean, it's like cool hip place, then half a block away, it's it's, it's a party. It's huh. tents. It's it, it's it's yeah. not even it's not shanty town stuff. It's big five like sporting like Dick Sporting like Goods urban stuff. Camping. Yeah, it's like somebody took a <laughs> Dick Sporting. Good I'm camping. trying to go. I'm trying it's to go like East high Coast class, for you. High class yeah. camping. I've seen, camping. I've seen some of these tents will set you back like 110 bucks. Yeah. Like they're nice. The Eastern tents. Mountain Sports Camping. And they're, REI camping. They're on sidewalks though. They're not in vacant yeah. lots. It's just all the way up and down the fucking sidewalks. Communities yeah. have popped up. Right. Are you sure they're homeless? It's not like Boy Scouts or something. <laughs> they're really committed to <laughs> it. Or some kind of urban badge. Boy Scouts keep their beards a little neater, I've found. <laughs> I don't have ne- ne- nearly as much tartar sauce in their beards. Okay, so you are sure. Wait, so, Adam, I'm. Uh, what? Where, where does this let out? <laughs> the like, story? Never. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just the, the, the no, fury the, about The fury they, is. They could be it, making proper signs, but they're not. No, they have signs. Yeah. The signs <laughs> say click it or ticket. They have signs to pass on information, in other words. They just word. choose not to pass on anything use, useful. Well, they don't pass on the, the 110 is closed because what do they give a fuck? They don't give Can a I, shit about you waiting no. or being stuck somewhere. They give a shit about making money or pretending to care about safety. If they cared about traffic, the sign would say 110 closed, in which case I would hop off the freeway immediately and cut across town. Can I ask you a question? And the homeless thing is driving me nuts, too. (laughs) There's fucking tents pitched all over the street. And... We pay a shitload in taxes. Why are there so many fucking homeless people? And how can they afford tents? And they're really nice tents. They're definitely <laughs> ripping off sometimes, tents somewhere. Sometimes when I'm on this podcast, I wonder, like, if you didn't have a podcast, where does the anger it go? It backs up, right? Like, what what would happen to your body? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> no, I, I have a question. Hold on. Yeah. Can I interrupt? Because I'm such a big Loveline fan, and I always wondered, because I would, you know, I'd be driving to these gigs in West Virginia or Ohio in the middle of the night. Long, long drives, and, and Love Line, and it's all shitty radio. Whatever. It's all the, mm-hmm. That's Dr. Drew, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's all, radio, like, right? it's all like the worst radio shows. You know, mm-hmm. it's like same top 40 hits over and over again. Then you get to Love Line, you're like, oh, this is fascinating. Thanks. This is great. It's funny. It's interesting. You learn stuff. It's very intimate. But, like, what's crazy about it? Did you used to listen to Love oh, Line? Oh, yeah. You, 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 yeah, and, like, what's interesting to me about it is, like, it's so personal for like mainstream radio. Yeah. And do, do people come up to you all the time with their personal issues and just tell you there's like I have genital warts or like I I was raped when I was 14 and here's what my boy here's what my relationship is like. Time, now. Mike. Uh first <laughs> I'll dress genital warts and then we'll get to the raping and we'll do that off the air cuz I feel like that is more personal. Oh, I misunderstood. You're saying people 
Those right. are examples of questions, Examples. Adam. I got it now. Uh, people, you know, no, I'll tell you what they do. He's asking for a friend. Here's what they do all the time, which, which, which is always a horrible, hollow feeling, where they go, uh, we talk to people all the time. They're like 27 now. And they go, hey, man, I started listening to you when I was 13, and I really could have gone down the wrong path. But I, you kept me on the straight and narrow, and I had a rough patch, but you guys really brought me through to the light. And I'm looking at a guy with a barbell through his nose, you know. <laughs> I can see where that was and, going. And, you know, half the LAPD on his eyelids, you know. And I'm like, really? <laughs> Without you and your steady guiding hand, man, I really could have went to some pretty dark places. And it's like, I notice you have your tongue carved up like a dragon. That's it. That, uh, You've been listening to us. We molded this. This is this is what you brought. This is what we got. You fucking, uh, yeah. And and you know, I, I anyway, I have an aggressive piercing that's got infected, Doctor Drew. And it's like, <laughs> what are we talking about? Who are you listening to this whole time? Speaking of a uh, love line, we were teasing it last night, but I use it as uh, an example and sort of a metaphor for everybody and what we need to do as comedians mike berbiglia and uh people who have podcasts and people who speak in the media uh these paper tigers that try to knock you down and try to get you to apologize and these groups that claim to be advocates for asians or whoever their group is but and no one's ever they anointed themselves they spokesperson yeah. for all asian group, people yeah, or the, something there's always like a, a group for families of america R- yeah all your fucking groups and they put yeah. pressure and then you apologize and everything else and the wor- the what you need to do is not negotiate with terrorists. Like the thing with Sarah Silverman, with the Asians. Yeah. Yeah. She was on Conan a bunch of years ago. Yeah, that's a dickhead named Guy Ioki, and he literally just works alone out of one office with no windows. And he, he you want to talk about racist, he... He basically claims to represent all Asian races. <laughs> like, I, I think he's Japanese. He doesn't realize there are other right. Asian races, and sometimes they don't races and they don't get along so well. But he just represents all yeah. of them, and then comes and puts pressure on you, and then you have to kiss his ass. Uh, well, he can suck my cock now because uh, I got a pirate ship douchebag. And I don't need any of you people anymore. And I don't have to pretend to apologize for a joke I made or Sarah made at some point anyway. So here's me point um, to, to just to let people know how these people work. And now these guys are out of business. As soon as you stop apologizing, they're out of business. But you always apologize. And then they're back in business like people who take hostages. If you, no one ever paid ransom on a hostage, it would end. But it's like, oh, they got my son. Not well for the hostage. It's not good for the hostage. But if you pay, (laughs) if you negotiate and you pay, then they'll take more hostages. Um, Anyway, uh, I've said that Scientology was this way for a million years. And you couldn't say a bad thing about them. Otherwise, they'd come down on you. And in 1997, this is a long time ago, Dr. Drew called them a cult. And they sent us a script from the Celebrity Center, like the head of the Celebrity Center sent us a script to read on the air as if it was a conversation. Oh, my God. That's how insane these people are. And everyone said, do not make fun of Scientologists. They will ruin your life. They will follow you. They will take you down. Now... They'll it, hurt your loved ones. Like yeah, the stories gave, of so, what they would so, do is now it's the so great. It's they, scary. Gave you, they give you a script that said Drew says this, Adam yeah. says this, Drew says it, this. It's now the Wizard of Oz. It's the curtain has been pulled back, and everyone's talking about it, and they can't put out all these fires. But here's a uh, here's a clip first from 1997 of uh, me and Drew and the script they want us to read. I think the best way for them to handle this on the air would simply be to read my letter slash facts on the air. It could be during the beginning of the show <laughs> when they were talking back and forth before actually taking calls. It could be done in a professional manner, which takes re- responsibility for what he said. Mm, that sounded a little strange. Yet doesn't make him look bad. So see, you could save some face and apologize, and I could come off as a, a you know professional at the same time. Well, Drew, do you just want to try this? Let's no. just do the first half wow. of it. Let's get some calls. Let's just do the beginning Are of the apology. You're such a fucking <laughs> pussy. Here, uh, Drew, you play yourself. Adam, I want to clear the air on something here. <laughs> 
You mean you basically screwed up on something, oh and now God. you're going <laughs> the to fix it, your voice. Right? Yeah. Basically, I just received a fax from the vice president of the Church of Scientology Celebrity <laughs> Center in response to a statement on the air that I made about a week and a half ago. Andrew? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, they called me oh, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking about uh, blank... <laughs> oh. What is what that? Are you talking about? I, I don't know what he was talking about. I don't about. know. Wait. Uh, That's Kennedy, I, don't, I don't know what that blank know. is. He left a space. I guess he wanted me to improv there. He doesn't know me. I work <laughs> off a teleprompter. <laughs> and stated uh, that w they were a cult like Scientology. Oh, I guess you're talking about some other uh, okay, religion. Adam, Andrew, yes, the facts goes like this. Now you can read the whole letter. Oh, that's where you read the entire letter? Yes. So they gave us a prepared statement to That's read. Incredible. Now, here's why I'm a hero and a pioneer, because this is 1997 when everyone was scared shitless of Scientology. Here's what I said. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Not interested in what offended people think of me. Way too much of that going on in this society. You know, we made fun of Scientology. Everyone made a big deal about it. Scientology wrote us a big, long-winded letter, wanted us to apologize. We told Scientology to kiss my hairy ass, and they never wrote us another letter. They're pussies. They're cowards. Who cares? These guys taking it in the ass, no sense of humor. I can't imagine that, but I, I've laughed at them. So that's it. Uh, there's way too much backpedaling going on in this society. And by the way, what? Since uh, here, here's the thing I can't figure out either, Drew. Hmm. Do they really care? And if they do care, tell them to shut the F up. Shut up. Yeah. Hey, Scientology, send another letter. Ha! Send it. Send it. It's funny for us. Send it, all you a-holes. Send letters. Send it. It's a good time. Scientology, what did people tell us with them? Oh, don't cross Scientology. Oh, don't cross them. They'll ruin your life. They're scary people. You'll never get them off your back. Well, they sent one letter. We made fun of you. Where's the follow-up? Where is it? How long's it been, Drew? Maybe they have a sense of humor now. Now they don't. You know why they don't send any more letters? Because they know we don't care. They, they get nothing. Go ahead. Start a boycott, you pussies. Keep the, send another letter, Scientology. I'd love to read it. It's funny. It's funny to me. <laughs> I enjoy it. Got nice uh, ass-wiping material. Yeah, write the station. Go ahead. Get a boycott going. Be my guest. Yeah, but you won't do it, will you? Why? You get nothing. You don't get anything. So it's no fun for you. It's only fun when people are scared and people are apologizing and people are backpedaling. Because that's the only time you feel good about yourself. And the letter's not, not for anything other than to get people to backpedal. And they don't backpedal, then no letter. Send them. Come on, you hypocrite cowards. Send those letters. Scientology. Can, we, can I have Send one it. caveat yeah, to this? What happened? Can I, give you, can I throw in one caveat? Which yeah. is that you prefaced that audio, which is great, with I'm a pioneer. <laughs> But, and a hero. And, and a, a hero. hero. I'm a pioneer and a hero. But no one, don't, if you're a pioneer, doesn't it mean that other people did that after you? Well, now they are. They they are just took Who's a long doing time. it? Oh, Two, everyone's like 2013, 2013 yeah. like 2012 and a half. It took them a good so full people decade, are, other 15 people years. Are ignoring groups like that now? Paul Haggis came out last oh, okay. year. But, well, no, what I'm saying is. You, Scientology's been around for a long time, but you never saw any, like, exposés. There's no 60 Minutes yeah. version of it. There was no 2020, 48 hours. Nobody spoke about No former church members ever spoke about it. They did. Their faces were blurred out and their voices, whatever. Now... Yeah, guys like Paul Haggis and guys like that. There's a there's a bunch now because there's a lot of books that have come out by form. Well, I know of one who a guy who was like a former upper level Scientology guy who turned against him. Right. He's now written yeah. books, and so it's starting to crop up in a lot of but places. But the, the moral of the story is, you tell everyone to fuck <laughs> off, and they don't come back again. Now was Drew, or they shoot you. It is a good moral. Yeah, it's a good moral. Was mm -hmm. Drew nervous at all? Drew's always a big puss with everything, <laughs> but he always gets sucked into it with with me. And uh, there's nothing they can do about it. But that was a long fucking time ago. And now, like I said, what are they doing? They can't do. They, and, and but the more people that speak out, the less they can do about it because they just can't put out that many fires. Were the people around you worried at all? I, they, the they hoped I got shot. <laughs> that was their whole thing. I know. And like every night, was like, did oh. someone fucking shoot him in the parking lot, please. <laughs> Put us out of our misery. She did one of those where you taped a target to your back. Hey, boss, how's it going? <laughs> yeah. Slaps it on your back. Yeah. No, I know I was Anderson a... was open. Well, that, was always, that was before Anderson, believe it or not. Oh. I, I was always confused by the, what's the, Mike, Michael Richards. 
Yeah. When he when he when he said the N word, the mm-hmm. Laugh Factory, or whatever. Mm-hmm. I was watching that, just going, "Oh, he should just say, uh, yeah, I was improvising and it was crazy, and yeah, I don't stand behind that." Yeah. Like what? End what, of story, right? Well, what did he do? Didn't he? He, he was. Apologized. He, he did he apologize. Yeah. He made a but whole. But he didn't say it was part of his act, did he? No. No. But no. what I'm saying is he made a whole apology of it, and then right. it became a whole thing yeah. that was covered in the news. But isn't it end of story if, like, what you're saying, if he just goes, yeah, I improvised it, it's not part of my act, and it was crazy, and, yeah, it was crazy. I wouldn't say that again. That was uh, kind of that was kind of well, here's the, not here's, a great bit. Here's the thing. <laughs> Didn't uh, go well? No. I, I don't think you could go the, ah, I, you know, it was just imp- I didn't finish the groundling, so sometimes <laughs> I'd let the scenes run on a little bit. But um, it, it depends on two things. What the news cycle is. If, yes. if somebody puts a bomb if at the gets, finish line yeah. in ba- the you're Boston good. Marathon, you're then you're good. Yeah, he yeah. probably had a whole bad run of like three weeks of nothing no going yeah. down after that. There's another famous argument I got into with a Gloria Allred where um, she was explaining that uh, this could have helped his career. I like that. That's my <laughs> stupid That's my stupid or liar thing. This could have helped his career. And I said, no. Nah. And she said, well, you don't know that. And I said, yeah, I do know that. It was not her funnest moment. Yeah. She said, uh, you don't have a crystal ball. And I said, no, I have a crystal brain. And I can tell. <laughs> And she said, no, nah. now that was uh, what would it turn out to be like so seven, eight years ago, seven years ago now. I feel like it was oh seven. Mm-hmm. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And it. Well, uh, it's fun of duty was around. But do you remember how serious it was? It was uh, oh, Seinfeld it was went on Letterman, Letterman yeah. with him. It was so squeamish. It was. It, it was, was so cringeworthy. Yeah. I feel like it was at least I think it was like seven years ago. We play the clip. They play the all red clip. We were doing you, the morning show for the fir- for sure. So either oh six or oh seven. If you if you uh, have it, but this is uh, the great one. Gloria Allred is predicting that this may in fact help his career. Now he hasn't worked <laughs> <laughs> since that incident, so she should apologize. I'm sure I'm going to get one of those edible arrangements any day now from uh, the great one, Gloria Allred. But question, a hypothetical play. question for you, civil rights attorney Gloria Allred. What if these people were not black, but what if they were fat? Let's say they were morbidly obese, and he launched into a tirade about how fat they That'd were. Well, let's say mm-hmm. they were from the moon. Then this would be all a different set of No, I didn't, well, that wasn't my about, hypothetical. No. My hypothetical was overweight. Would you have the same case? Well, you know what? We are... We, we we just need to talk about the facts that we have. No, we're, well, I'm we're just not, I'm not asking you a pretty about, pretty easy question. We're not willing to talk about different facts in a different case with different situations. It's not a fact. On. It's a hypothetical. People do discriminate against fat people. You'd agree with that? That's well, uh, yes, I would agree with that. Well, do you, do you have an answer to my question? No, because what we're here to talk <laughs> Why about. Why not? What we're here to talk about is discrimination on account of race. Well, I would argue that it would hurt your cause if you answered my question honestly. Well, it is a question of whether it would hurt or would help. But we think that the issue of targeting someone on account of their race and hurting them. Well, what about other issues? Is what about what a sufficiently what a, important issue that that's the one we need to stay. What about on. gender? Well, you know, it, people also have a right not to be discriminated against on, a, on account of their gender. But is this discrimination? And not to be threatened on account of their gender. Well, again, so, threatened. You know, we, but we're dealing with the racial issue here. That's an extremely important issue. I don't think it gets enough discussion in our in our society. Oh, you don't, don't think, think we discuss much, racial we issues enough? <laughs> this is not enough about David discussion of racial yeah. issues in our society? Uh, no, I don't. Because Would you prefer it just be 100% racial <laughs> issue discussion, or is the 90% we're currently residing at enough for you? Well, I mean, I think as long as there is discrimination, as long as there is violence, as long this as there are threats hero. of violence, as long as there is, the, uh, as long as people who are in a privileged position, mm-hmm. like you and me, and uh, you know, a lot of other people throughout the country. As long as you know, as long as we don't understand what people who are African American often face and mm-hmm. are willing to address it, then those issues are going to continue to fester, and then ultimately explode in our society. Right. 
and you'll be in for a taste. I'll throw you. Well, I will be in to try you to right the wrong and seek justice. You can, I'll throw there, you. There, you can find the crystal. I didn't want to listen to the ten minutes I, part. I was trying to listen. To that when you, I was listening to the David Wild, when you were talking mm-hmm. to David Wild earlier, and you're like, "We don't need to talk more about race." I thought that was a that's a funny point. I think there's It'd be some, nice there's to some have truth a, to that. But and I like that I like your joke in the clip you just played of like should we talk about race one hundred percent of the time? <laughs> yeah, but, but she's I will a say hero. That, I will say this: whenever people say, um, you know, that race is not a factor with Obama and all this stuff, because that is a, a, an argument people will make. They'll go, well, is, you know, race. It, it, mm-hmm. People make too much of it. Race isn't really a, a factor with Obama. Well, I always say like, well. You know how, like, think of, like, your most racist friend, Mm -hmm. and then... um, Hold on, i got to find a mirror. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Think of your most racist friend. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Did that that person vote for Obama? Yeah. What percent chance did that person vote for Obama? And then you're like, oh, well, you're right. That person does exist. And then, yeah, it but is an I, issue. I think it's real. My, it's maybe not as big of, my, as people make my it. My feeling is, and I think we're all guilty of this, and it's a kind of a happy racism. It's going to be the name of my next book, which is <laughs> I believe that because of that guy, that everyone in this room does tries a little harder. Like, I'll bet you there's five guys who voted for Obama because he was black. For that one guy to make up for that guy. Do you think so? I think there's five a, to one. Well, there. Well, he won the election, so somebody's <laughs> somebody's voting by a very narrow margin. Yeah, but but black folk represent I don't know twelve, thirteen percent of the population or whatever whatever it is. Whitey had to vote for Obama. Yeah, and I I know personally, and most white folks will tell you this that if it's a kind of a thing where. They're walking like I'll do it. If if a white bum comes up to me, it's like get a job. If a black bum comes up to me, I'll try to throw a quarter in his thing because I feel bad for the past. And if it's not that there are any black bums, but I'm saying if (laughs) hypothetically I was on a planet with a black bum or just little things. If there's a black person like leaving the store or something, I'll I'll hang on to the door for an extra beat or whatever because I I, I those are your reparations. I those are my reparations. I want to make up for that racist guy, and I don't want him. Yeah, you trying to show that you're not racist? Yes, I will do. I will do. And in oh. traffic, I will do a lot of honking and finger wagging and get the fuck off. There. If it's a black dude or black chick, I back off because I'm like, eh, you know what I'm going to overcompensate. A lot well, but seriously, with- there had to be a large percentage of people who voted for him because they're white and he's black and they want to be progressive. Like they want to go. Yeah. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but they want to go. This is good. This shows we're moving a good direction. Yeah. So I do say for every one of the hicks that didn't, there were a couple of people that went, wouldn't it be cool to say you voted for the first black president? The second two. Sorry, Alice. It was cool. All right, here's what I have trouble with. <laughs> it's emb- I, I, I'm uncomfortable admitting this. But if someone says, what did he or she look like? And you're trying to describe someone. Mm-hmm. I feel uncomfortable if the first thing I say is black. Right. And yet I feel like I feel like an idiot if I sort of like a oh, dark hair and yeah, um, I think she I, was wearing this color. I think, I think you have to start. You work big to small <laughs> in the cock department, sweetie. No, but you work with the thing that the body that the person's body's covered with, Tall. and then get to their earrings. Yeah, that's the way okay. I I look at it. All right. Oh, I think we have the uh, crystal brain here. By the way, yeah. Sorry. This is Michael. But Richards. I think if you asked Michael Richards whether he prefer or Michael Richards' representation as publicist or as agents whether they prefer this incident happen or not, they would. Of course, say no. Well, that's not the question of whether they would prefer it happen. The question is, will it enhance his career? No. And we don't know the answer to that. Yes, yet. we do. You're the answer is no. no. <laughs> because you've got a crystal ball that I don't have. No, I have a crystal brain that thinks logically. Well, you don't. You really don't know about these things. So the point is, we'll leave this. Up I do know. I do know this hasn't helped them, just like OJ case wasn't helped by what he did well, there's not, many examples well, of it uh, you know michael richards are killing anyone so there's a little right. difference no it's i'm a little saying different. look what he did was wrong and he deserves to be punished he is being punished he's being humiliated well you think that see i think he's been out there looking for sympathy from the public and uh, but we're looking and you're and looking for money he, he's been concerned
concerned, rightfully so, about the damage to his career. Now we're concerned mm -hmm. about the damage to All our right. clients and to the. She victims. doesn't know if it's going to hurt his career or not. That's my opinion, but I it don't might, know. It according might. to her, it might enhance his career. Now you have to say, stupid or liar. Oh. For sure, for sure, liar. Liar. In this case, yeah, it's an educated woman. I, no, no, I. I think maybe <laughs> stupid. I think I might go stupid. Well, no, no, no. no someone who doesn't under, I think someone stupid. who doesn't understand show business. Stupid enough. No, no. I think no, 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 no. Come on, come no, on. No. Liar. <laughs> uh, here's how I'm going to help you. I'm going to yes and with you here. Okay, okay. Liar, and that you know that standing up on stage and dropping 175 n bombs is not going to enhance your career. Stupid enough to try to pretend to me that it may help. See, it's stupid and That's liar stupid and in, liar, this, yeah. in this case. Are you trying to help me through this? I'm trying to, I'm trying to sort trying of to agree with you. Are you trying to help me through my him. opinion? When she yeah. said there's no there's no way we know whether this is going to help his career or not, she knows the answer to that. A very, I, I believe, yeah. A, a simple, a very simple. No, I think some people just don't understand show business. They go, well, maybe you know, so he's on TV a lot. She's now. not you're an underwater welder. You're though. presupposing then that she is being her authentic, honest, truthful self in that conversation. Do you think that's what she was doing? Yeah, maybe. You do, you. <laughs> now stupid or liar for Mike Birbiglia. <laughs> is he stupid or is he lying Both. about this? Both. No, help us through First this. First off, hold on. Let me explain something. She does not work for the city of Michigan in in the waste management department. Right. Who does she work for? She's a D D Los Who's Angeles up? Hollywood whore attorney. Oh, she's a whore as well? <laughs> well, she that changes everything. She is a Hollywood attorney whore who attorney. handles profi <laughs> high-profile cases and tries and to get she's money. she's a whore? <laughs> yeah. So to speak, a money whore. It's that she didn't just fall off you the cabbage truck. She's... She lives in Los okay. Angeles and does a bunch of high-profile cases trying to get money out of people. Okay, okay, okay. So she okay. would know. Okay, so liar. liar. Okay, thank you. Uh, Allison Rosen, one news story shall we do? Yes. News with okay. Allison Rosen. She'll read some news from her iPad. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. It's Allison. <laughs> Allison. I always love this song. And when it's yeah. time to wrap it up, she'll sign it off with zip it, cut it. It's Allison. Allison. I'm trying to decide if we should do a Boston update. Yeah, no, okay, we'll, we'll catch up tomorrow. All right, here's something that is also depressing, but not in the same way. Graffiti is forcing the closure of certain popular hiking spots in Joshua Tree. And the Joshua Tree, uh, their people are saying that they are blaming the bump in graffiti on social media because people are posting photos of graffiti on Twitter or Facebook. And then it's um, encouraging we, we more. Graffiti. Blame it on social media or just plain fucking douchebaggery and narcissism, which is just out of control. Like, we need to reel it back in in this country in a big way. I've told you, you're not going to get on a flight that doesn't have a fucking assistant dog on it. And you're not going to go somewhere that doesn't have the people are carving initials into the side of the cacti and stuff like that inside. Like, we're graffitiing nature. Like, they'd get a hummingbird if they could. It's so fucking tiny little nozzle. Little, the well, ultimate prize. <laughs> yes. So fucking sad what we're yeah. turning into. And what we need to do is we need to start kicking people's asses a little bit. Stop telling your kids they're the fucking hub of the universe. Uh, the ranger Pat Pilker says, I've worked at six national parks and this is the most extensive I've seen in 20 years. And anything in the Los Angeles area, and this is sort of outside the Los Angeles area, but not much, is just turning into fucking junk. It's just a filthy Have you ever pit. seen someone in the process of graffitiing? No. Because I don't think I ever have. I, you know? have, I haven't, but I, I can tell you that if you drive down the, the saddest thing in the world, if you drive down the 170 and you're heading like toward Magic Mountain or something, you're heading up the Grapevine, you will pass this new freeway overpass that they've been building for the last three years. The graffiti follows the... <laughs> progression of it so they extend it you know eight feet and then the next day that eight feet has been tagged and it looks like an old off-ramp that they're tearing down because it's been tagged but this is pre-tagged it's like it's literally getting tagged as they're building it which is <laughs> fucking it's so sad i just said just start mixing the fucking spray paint in with the concrete and let's call it a day like we'll, we'll save ourselves this 
this lengthy process of having guys, oh, yeah, gangbangers, climb up pre, scaffolding. Pre-tagged Put graffiti. Pre-tagged graffiti. That's smart. That's right. It's so what? fucking sad. Los Angeles is such an armpit and such a piece of I've shit. one question for Adam before we yes. go, which is, you have kids, right? Yes. How many kids? Two or three. Do they hear this all the time? Like, when you're driving, you're like, ah, the fucking graffiti, you know, they keep, yeah, keep going something. when you're, you know, oh, you're, yeah. they, when they build it, they, they do the graffiti every day. Like, all right. Be, 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 like, this might be my favorite impression yet. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> There's the ramp. I took a fucking picture of it. You can see it at amcurl.com. It is tagged all the way to the end. They're not yeah, tearing it, it looks- down. They're building it. All right. Looks run down. This is the society we've crafted. <laughs> Good or bad? Bad. Okay. Shall we pick a, a course change? Shall we correct our course or stay the course, we're everybody? Waiting you, we're waiting for you to run for office. Please. I can't get fucking elected because I'll tell the truth and then I won't get the vote. All right. One last one. Let's bring it home, baby girl. Okay. What do we got? Half we got- a story. All right, Adam, I think that you will you will enjoy this news, mm. which is a study has come out saying that uh, dads are just as good as moms at identifying their baby's unique cry. So being able to mm. hear a cry and to say, that's my child versus all these other yeah. children. Yeah. But I think the, the thinking was that mothers would be better at that. Well, we just don't lactate. That's true. As much yeah. anymore. But parents... Yes. <laughs> As opposed to the heyday of yes, male lactation. That's right. Um, but yeah, it, they're saying that dads are just as good, and it just has to do with exposure to the child. So mm-hmm. whoever's taking care of the kid mm-hmm. it, it is just going to be just as good at identifying the cries. My nanny recognizes my cry. Olga! <laughs> Shut those fucking kids up! <laughs> that's my cry that she recognizes. From hearing it all the time. She knows it well. Yeah. Yeah. That's the news. I'm Allison Rosen. Zip it, cunts. That was the news with Allison Rosen. Ah. Uh, all right, I want to thank David Wilde for coming in here. I want to thank Mike Berbiglia for coming in here. Thanks. Sleepwalk with me, available on iTunes and Netflix. And if people are in London, I'll be there next week. Oh, we have fans in London. Yeah. They're, they're part, part of Sundance London. We, I'm doing a Q&A with Jimmy Carr at the O2. Wow, that sounds cool. That's yeah, fun. Uh, so check that out. Check out his website, Burbigs.com, and tweet him at Burbigs as well. That's B-I-R. Burbigs.com. Always great to see you, my great friend. Great to see you. So until next time, Sam Crowell for David Wilde, Mike Burbiglia, Allison Rosen, and Bald Brian say it. Mahalo. Hey, kitties, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and catch any podcasts you might have missed at YouTube.com slash Adam Carolla. That's youtube.com slash me.